Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome on this cold January evening. I am Xavier Salomon. I'm the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator here at the Frick. So each year, the Frick Collection invites a prominent scholar to deliver the Alex Gordon Lecture. Mr. Gordon was a significant collector of European drawings and paintings, but also of pre-Columbian art, of Russian icons, and he established um, a very noticeable library of many thousand volumes. In addition to his generous patronage here at the Frick, his estate has also funded scholarship in many different art historical fields and has supported programs over the years in other institutions such as the Morgan Library, the Neuberger Museum of Art, and Columbia University. So we're deeply grateful to Mr. Gordon and to his family for their invaluable support over this program. It is with great pleasure that I introduce this year's prominent speaker, Dr. Gabriele Finaldi, the director of the National Gallery in London. Dr. Finaldi studied art history at the Cortal Institute of Art in London, where he completed his PhD in 1995 on Giuseppe de Ribera, the great 17th century Spanish artist who in fact spent most, well, all of his life and career in Naples, in Italy. So one of those discussions, is he really Spanish or is he Italian? Um, Ribera has remained really one of Dr. Finaldi's main interests as he completed the catalog resume of Ribera's drawings as recently as 2016. And the publication of this very important volume was accompanied by an equally outstanding exhibition on the subject, um, which took place at the Museo del Prado in Madrid and at the Meadows Museum in Dallas. Dr. Finaldi has curated a number of exhibitions in the United Kingdom, in Spain, in Italy, Belgium, and the United States, and has published wildly on Spanish artists, such as also Velazquez and Zurbaran, and Italian Baroque painting. He was the curator of later Italian and Spanish paintings at the National Gallery in London between 1992 and 2002. And subsequently, he moved to Madrid, where he was the deputy director for collections and research at the Museo del Prado, where he oversaw, over more than a decade, some of the best exhibitions and research projects that were carried out probably anywhere at that time. He returned to the National Gallery as its director as recently as 2015. It is a pleasure to host Dr. Finaldi here at the Frick this evening, especially since his visit coincides with two exhibition projects at the Frick, the foundations of which were really based on Dr. Finaldi's scholarly work. In 1994, he curated the exhibition which brought together Zurbaran's Jacob and his 12 sons, the 12, 12 tribes of Israel, from Auckland Castle in County Durham in the north of England to the National Gallery to Trafalgar Square. The paintings are now here physically at the Frick for an exhibition which will present them again, but for the first time in New York City and which will open here at the Frick next Wednesday. More recently, in 2012 to 2013, Dr. Finaldi curated another exhibition which took place in Madrid at the Museo del Prado, in Seville at the Fundación Focus, which is housed in the Hospital de los Venerables, and in London at Dalish Picture Gallery, so three venues. And the exhibition was entitled Murillo and Justino de Neve, uh, The Art of Friendship. This tightly focused, beautifully selected, and scholarly rigorous project is really one of the major inspirations behind the exhibition Murillo, the self-portraits, which is now on view here at the Frick in the lower gal level galleries until February 11th, and which I curated together with Dr. Finaldi's colleague, Dr. Letizia Treves, who is his successor as curator of Italian and Spanish paintings at the National Gallery in London. And as a reminder, the exhibition will remain open after this lecture until about 7.45, so you can see it if you haven't seen it before. Tonight's lecture is sadly the last in a series of programs relating to the Murillo exhibition um, before it closes. Uh, it's entitled Paintings Made in Friendship, Murillo and Justino de Neve, and it focuses on the friendship between the Sevillan artist and Justino de Neve, who was a priest and canon of Seville Cathedral. Murillo painted for Neve religious subjects, portraits, allegories, even miniatures on copper. And many of these works were identified recently in view of the exhibition which Dr. Finaldi curated in Madrid, Seville, and London. I would like at this time to remind you that tonight's lecture is going to be streamed live and will be on our website and available for online viewing later on. And I would please also ask you to turn off your cell phones at this time 
and remind you that following tonight's lecture, I would like to invite you all to join us for a reception in the Garden Court to celebrate tonight's speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gabriele Finaldi. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great, great pleasure, I have to say, uh, to be here at the Frick to give this um, talk. I'm very pleased to have been um, invited and uh, very honored to uh, give it. Um, could I welcome you also myself um, to uh, this evening's lecture? Um, there's a good number of friends here, friends from uh, museums, um, good friends from um, the Prado too, at the Louvre, and of course the Frick. And I'm particularly grateful to uh, Xavier for those very warm words uh, of welcome. Thank you to Ian, um, the director. And could I also welcome um, members of the uh, Board of Trustees of the American Friends of the National Gallery who are also here tonight. So thank you all very much for coming along. Um, <clears throat> many of you will have known uh, Bill Jordan, the distinguished uh, uh, Hispanist who uh, died on Monday. He was a good friend and had done some superb work on uh, Spanish painting, of the 17th century in particular. He was a great specialist on an artist called Juan van der Hamen, but his um, specialization extended in lots of different uh, directions. And I was very fortunate to work with him at the National Gallery years and years ago on an exhibition on Spanish still life painting, which I think was a very good exhibition, rather important one. Um, so I'd like to honor his memory in the lecture this evening. So these are two of the faces of the civilian Baroque. They constitute the identikit of an ideal relationship between patron and painter, where the artistic and spiritual concerns of the two men overlapped to perfection, where ambition and skill on both sides of the relationship aligned to create circumstances for the production of the very finest artistic works. Murillo, on the left, and Justina de Neve on the right were also good friends. Murillo is shown about 50 years old in this self-portrait. By this time, in the late 1660s, he had been the most famous painter in the city of Seville for over a decade, and he was also one of the most celebrated artists in Spain. His work was beginning to be admired abroad. Justino de Neve, a priest and canon of Seville Cathedral, was 40 years of age at the time of this portrait, 1665. He was seven years younger than Murillo. He was recognized for his piety and his kindness. He was a very able administrator and a collector of paintings and bibliophile. The friendship between Murillo and Neve gave rise to a remarkable group of paintings public and private commissions, as well as gifts from the artists to the churchmen, and they include several of the artists' masterpieces. All the paintings date from the 1660s and 70s, a period which saw both men engaged in some of the most significant artistic endeavors of the period in Seville, and they constitute a corpus of mature works from the time when Murillo was at the very peak of his fame producing pictures of a consistently high aesthetic and expressive level. They are illustrative of his remarkable painting technique, his astounding command of his palette of colors, and also of his iconographic inventiveness. The personal relationship between artist and patron and the paintings that emerge from it take us to the very heart of the civilian Baroque. His afternoon prayer momentarily interrupted, Don Justino de Neve y Chavez turns to greet the visitor who has just entered the room. His gaze is lively and focused, and he keeps his finger marking the page in his diurno, his little prayer book, suggesting that the encounter will not be a long one. His right hand grips the chair arm, and he is caught between stasis and action, as if about to rise and make his welcome that much more effusive. The color of his robe is a discreet black, but it is long and flowing with split sleeves made with generous lengths of cloth, and his shoes are of soft chamois leather. His pug, adorned with a collar with little bells and a dainty red bow, 
looks up dreamily at his master. He is both a pet and an allegory of devotion. On the table, three objects speak eloquently of Don Justino's wealth, learning, and refined taste. The Augsburg-style gilt table clock alludes to an orderly existence defined by the canonical hours of the day, the liturgical feasts of the Roman calendar, and the duties of service to the Cathedral of Seville, where Don Justino exercised his ministry from the time of his priestly ordination. The large leather-bound book with clasps is one of the volumes from his considerable library of 325 books on religion, history, and poetry, and testifies to his intellectual curiosity. With a silver bell, he summons his slaves and his servants in the large and well-appointed house he shares with several family members in the parish of San Bartolomé. Born in 1625 from a father of Flemish origin, de Neve, and from a Spanish mother from Malaga, Chavis, he was a, an Hidalgo, or member of the minor nobility. His coat of arms shows the Neve arms on the left, and the keys, or Yavis, of the Chavis family. Neve, meaning snow, nieve in Spanish, nieve in Latin, and the keys, symbol of St. Peter, would feature in a significant way in his life, as we will see. The inscription in Latin is a testament to the friendship between the artist and the sitter. His age, 40, Bartolome Murillo of Seville painted this with the intention of making a gift of it in the year 1665. Their friendship probably began in the early 1660s and grew ever stronger based on shared spiritual, family, and business interests. Murillo acted as valuer of the pictures which had belonged to Don Justino's mother. Murillo's daughter professed in the same Dominican convent in which Justino's sister and niece were also nuns. Murillo's son, Gaspar, became a priest and also, later on, a canon of the cathedral, no doubt thanks in part to Don Justino's support. And very significantly, when in 1682, Murillo drew up his will, he named Don Justino as one of the executors of his estate. Ordained in 1649, from what we can garner from descriptions of Don Justino and from the documents regarding his activities, he was a devoted churchman, a model of the Tridentine presbyter, concerned with maintaining the prerogatives and status of the church, but also its spiritual and moral discipline. He displayed a special devotion to the Immaculate Conception and to the sacrament of the Eucharist as well as a marked veneration for the saints of the Diocese of Seville. Like his contemporaries, um, Ambrosio Espinola, who was Archbishop of Seville, and the layman Miguel de Mañara, who refounded one of the city's most important charitable institutions, the Hospital de la Caridad, he was involved in the establishment and maintenance of charitable bodies that aim to alleviate the suffering of the poor, the aged, the infirm. And he participated actively in the life of several confraternities. Neve was born wealthy and successfully managed the portfolio of properties and investments he had inherited and acquired for the benefit of his family and for the various religious foundations with which he was associated. In 1658, he became a canon of the cathedral, the nerve center of civilian religious life. And his successful career in the cathedral chapter reflects his administrative abilities and what today we would call his fundraising skills. His tombstone in the cathedral states that he was a vir templo natus, a man born to serve the church. 
He must also have been, and I think Murillo's portrait testifies to it, or at least suggests it, he was also a man of some social grace. Seville Cathedral was and remains one of the largest and most spectacular cathedrals in the world. Built after the Reconquista in the area once occupied by the city's Grand Mosque, its impressive bell tower, the Giralda, a repurposed minaret, dominates the city's skyline. Richly endowed and magnificently decorated, the cathedral played a role of great importance in the life of the city, a city which in the 17th century was one of the largest in Europe. Seville was the gateway to the Americas and was renowned for its wealth and its beauty. Quien no ha visto Sevilla, no ha visto Maravilla, went the, frame, went the refrain. If you haven't seen Seville, you've missed a remarkable marvel. Its palaces, its churches, its religious foundations, as well as its painters, Francisco Pacheco, Velázquez, Murillo himself, Zoboran, and Valdés, among others, added to the luster of the city. This is quite a useful uh, slide because uh, you can see the Giralda here. Um, you can just make out this building here, which is the chapter house, which I'll refer to in just a moment. Uh, this building here, adjacent to the cathedral, is the bishop's palace, where the bishop still uh, resides today. And if you look over at the top right, this building here is the Hospital de los Venerables, which we'll talk about in just a moment. The canons of the cathedral are responsible for looking after the cathedral building. Here they are. These are the current canons of Seville Cathedral. Um, I was very uh, uh, honored to be able to show them around uh, an exhibition, the exhibition that Xavier referred to uh, in, uh, in Seville a few years ago. So they're responsible for looking after the cathedral building, attending to the religious services, and administering the cathedral's finances, their possessions, their archive, their properties. They elect a dean and are all under the authority of the bishop, but they do have a certain amount of autonomy. And sometimes, just sometimes, the relationship between bishop and chapter can be quite difficult. So these, I said, are the current canons, the descendants, as it were, of Don Justino. In Murillo's time, the canons of Seville Cathedral were often quite wealthy in their own right, and we know that some of them were collectors and patrons of painting, although none as important as Don Justino himself. The first works by Murillo to enter the cathedral were two paintings of San Isidoro and San Leandro, two of the early Visigothic bishops of the city. They were donated in 1655 by one of the canons, Juan de Federighi, uh, for the decoration of the sacristy. At the time Juan de Federighi made this gift to the cathedral, he declared that the pictures were by the hand of the best painter there is today in Seville. This was a very significant appraisal given that Zorbaran, who was a generation older than Murillo, was still very active in the city. But clearly Murillo was taking the place, uh, the, the prominent position that Zorbaran had occupied uh, up to um, the, the late 1640s. Shortly afterwards, Murillo was commissioned to paint an enormous picture of St. Anthony appearing to the Christ child for the baptistry chapel, a work that seemed to confirm his position as Seville's leading painter. I think you can see in this work um, Murillo's skill at orchestrating a grand composition something which, incidentally, I think mm, Zorbran always had some difficulty with. Um, Murillo was very, very skilled at organizing lots of uh, figures and enabling them to uh, relate to one another. 
and very skillfully combining earthly and uh, heavenly realms uh, in this very, very large canvas. I'd like, if I may, to return for a moment to Murillo's portrait of Don Justino. It forms part of a relatively small portrait of by the artist, and it's great to celebrate here uh, at the Frick, an exhibition that lo does look at Murillo's portraiture. It's an area where very or relatively little work has been done, and quite a few of Murillo's sitters uh, for the time being remain anonymous. There's never been an exhibition held on Murillo's portraits until now. There really wasn't in Spain an established format of portraits for portraits of canons. And Murillo uh, turned to grander precedence as represented by the tradition of papal or cardinal's portraits. So I'm showing you a picture that you know well on the left. It's just across the street. Uh, Greco's impressive portrait of a cardinal, probably Cardinal Nino de Guevara, um, of about 1600, painted in Toledo. Uh, and on the right, uh, Guido Reni's Cardinal Spada from about 1631. The formal parallels are obvious, but it does remain surprising. He was not a bishop. He was not an archbishop. He was not a cardinal. He most certainly wasn't a pope. Uh, that Don Justino, uh, as a canon of the cathedral, should have had himself represented at full length. The kinds of canon portraits that Don Justino may have had some knowledge of, this is very tentative, but here are um, two from a series of canon portraits uh, at Antwerp Cathedral. Uh, we're not aware that Justino ever traveled to Flanders, but because of his um, Flemish family background, he may have had uh, some contact with the uh, Diocese of Antwerp. Recently, it's been proposed, and I think it does seem to make quite a lot of sense, that the particular model which Murillo employed for his portrait of Don Justino is this print of Cardinal Mazarin. And there are indeed numerous similarities. While the portrait of Don Justino retains a, distinctive, uh, a distinctively Spanish austerity, uh, reticence, and gravitas, uh, to my knowledge, no Spanish cathedral canon had ever had himself represented in such a grandiose manner before 1665. The format may reflect Murillo's high appreciation of Don Justino, and it's clear from the inscription that it was made as a gift from the artist. Murillo had reasons to be grateful to Don Justino, as we will see. And we know that the portrait was uh, made for Don Justino's own house. It remained in his possession, and it, it was only at his death that it was bequeathed to the hospital for retired priests, the Hospital de los Venerables, that he founded. Uh, he declared in his will, I especially want that a full-length portrait of me, a painting by Don Bartolomé Murillo, be entrusted to the current or future administrator of the said house, that's the Hospital de los Venerables, and I request that he place it wherever he pleases in the house, where they, the priests, can remember to pray to God our merciful Lord, for my soul. The date on the portrait, 1665, coincides with the completion of a church rebuilding and redecoration project that had been led by Don Justino and for which Murillo was to paint uh, some of his finest works. And that is the uh, church of Santa Maria la Blanca, the church, a former mosque and subsequently a synagogue, was administered directly by the cathedral. And Justino had taken a special interest in it since the late 1650s. The dedication to Santa Maria la Blanca uh, was the same as the dedication of the Roman Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major known as Sancta Maria ad Nives, or St. Mary of the Snows. 
And for Don Justino, it combined an allusion to the Virgin's snowy white purity with a completely fortuitous reference to his own surname. The rebuilding of the church was motivated by the desire to respond to the publication of a papal brief at the end of 1661, Alexander VII, called Sollicitudo Omnium Ecclesiarum, which defended the belief in the Virgin's immaculate conception, that is, that she was sinless from the first instance, the first instant of her existence. The belief was very strongly held and promoted by the diocesan authorities in Seville and by the Spanish crown, both of whom uh, had actively lobbied for its official sanction uh, in Rome. So the brief, when it was published in 1661, was seen as a spiritual and diplomatic triumph. And it was celebrated throughout Spain and especially in Seville with a host of special processions, activities, te deums, new artistic commissions, the construction of new chapels, and also a complete rebuilding of this church here, uh, whose name already alluded to the belief in the Virgin's immaculate state. Modest on the exterior, the interior shows the elaborate plasterwork, or yeseria in Spanish, designed by the sculptor Pedro Roldan and executed by the Borja brothers in 1663 to 1664. Every surface on the ceiling, uh, in, the, in the, uh, uh, the, the main nave, uh, in, is, is covered with plaster scrollwork uh, uh, and other bits, other walls, other surfaces in the church are uh, painted in gold and white. The crowning achievement in the decoration was to be a set of four paintings that Don Justino turned to Murillo uh, to paint. Two large lunettes. Uh, here you see uh, recent uh, work that was done in Santa Maria la Blanca, uh, revealed in this arch that sits just beneath the dome, uh, at the top end of the, of the nave, uh, the horseshoe arches which are typical of uh, Moorish architecture in the city. So Murillo was commissioned to paint uh, two pictures to sit just beneath uh, the dome, and then uh, two other pictures at the top end of uh, the aisles either side. That gives you uh, an idea of where uh, these lunettes uh, fitted in in relation to the crossing uh, of the church. And there's, uh, there's one of them. <clears throat> So the artist responded to this invitation from uh, Don Justino, who was responsible really for the complete refurbishment uh, of the church, uh, with this picture here, the foundation of uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, uh, the patrician's uh, dream, and the pendant picture that you'll see in just a moment. These are subjects that are not frequently uh, represented. There wasn't a, a rich visual tradition that Murillo could draw on. So he really had to exercise his uh, invention. And they are, I think, amongst his most uh, brilliant and successful pictures. They're very large, um, about six meters, slightly more, across. So uh, for the moment, just ignore the uh, corners uh, here. Um, they're from a later period. I'll mention those in just a moment. So the picture shows, uh, as it says there, the patrician's dream. In the uh, night of the 4th to the 5th of August, uh, in the middle of the Roman summer, a uh, patrician called Johannes, uh, during the time of Pope Liberius in the 4th century, uh, who had the pious desire to build a chapel in Rome in honor of the Virgin, had a dream. And the dream was of the Virgin appearing to him, uh, indicating where this chapel, where this church should be built. The instruction was that he should go out to the Esquiline Hill, one of the seven uh, hills of Rome, and there he would find, in the middle of the summer, remember it's the 5th of August, that there had been a snowfall, a miraculous snowfall, and that the snowfall marked the place where the church should be built. Even more helpfully, 
and you see this in some of the very rare representations of the subjects, of this subject, um, the snowfall will have marked out the shape of the church on the ground to give, um, to give him a leg up. So uh, Johannes woke in the morning, very impressed by this dream, uh, to discover that his wife had also had the very, very same dream. So they decide to approach the Pope to tell him about this dream that they had had and to seek his blessing for their pious intention. It's uh, a night scene, of course. Um, there's the wonderful representation of the sleeping uh, Juan. Um, it's not untypical, I think, of uh, Murillo, who's a very sort of chaste painter in many ways, that um, the couple are not shown in bed and they're shown fully dressed. So uh, he's asleep at his table, as though you know, his devotions have, um, have taken him uh, late into the night. And the large bed uh, sits behind them. You can just see the, the, the headboard and the, and the cushions there. Um, and it's um, while she sleeps um, at the foot of the bed, and he uh, leans his uh, face on his elbow, uh, that they have this, uh, this dream. There's a wonderful description by a, a very famous Spanish um, art historian called Diego Angulo, who may have um, been known to one or two people in the room here, where he talks about uh, the canicula. Canicula, that's a word that I only discovered when I went to live in Spain. Canicula is a word that's used particularly in southern Spain. It refers to the hottest moment in the day in Andalusia, which can easily be, uh, you know, 45 uh, degrees Celsius. And it's a, it's a time when nobody goes out onto the streets, not even animals. You might find the odd Englishman, but you certainly wouldn't find any civilian, any self-respecting Spaniard, uh, would stay inside. And that's the hour, of course, of the siesta. And he describes uh, this as the sort of perfect rendition in paint in the 17th century of the uh, civilian uh, canicula. In the uh, pendant picture, uh, you have the following episode where uh, Juan and his uh, spouse go to see Pope Liberius and recount their dream to him. Well, the Pope has also had that very same dream, and so he orders that a procession should be uh, organized to go out to the Esquiline Hill, and sure enough, uh, they find the hill covered in snow, and that's where the uh, chapel, which then becomes the basilica, will be built. Interestingly, Murillo gives uh, Pope Liberius uh, the likeness of Alexander VII Kiji, uh, the ruling pope who had published that brief in 1661. Um, for uh, people who love processing so much, and the Spaniards still do it an awful lot today, uh, this is a very, very rare uh, rendition in paint of a religious procession. It is a bit of a paradox that uh, religious pro uh, processions are rarely represented in Spanish painting. These two pictures uh, were removed by the French in Seville in 1810 and were handed over by Napoleon's military governor of Andalusia, Marshal Soult, to the Musée Napoléon, the Louvre, in 1813 when the corners were painted with neoclassical trophies and plans and elevations of the early Christian Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore and the subsequent uh, Baroque a church designed by uh, Ferdinando Fuga. But um, you can see um, this sort of um, empire style uh, decoration on the edges of the two pictures. They were executed, I discovered, by somebody called Monch, who was uh, working under the direction of the architect Charles Percier. Interestingly, these pictures uh, returned to Spain almost immediately. Uh, after they'd been taken to Paris. They were back in uh, Madrid uh, by the late uh, 1810s, and uh, they went to the Academy in Madrid. They didn't return to Seville. Uh, the academicians uh, decided not to remove uh, these additions that turned them into rectangular pictures, and they've uh, stayed on uh, the pictures right up to today. They're completely inappropriate, but of course, pictures carry with them their own history. And by now, they've been on the pictures longer than off. At the end of the two side aisles, uh, Murillo painted two scenes. So those two pictures are positioned there. And at the end of the side aisles, that's there and there, uh, Murillo painted two scenes, the first of which on the left 
shows the Immaculate Conception being venerated by a group of devout figures. The text of the scroll in the Immaculate Conception, which may be translated, in the beginning he delighted in her, alludes to the origin of the Virgin in the mind of God. The iconography of the Immaculate Conception uh, is based, as you all know, on a text in the Apocalypse, which refers to a woman crowned with 12 stars and standing upon the moon. Murillo transformed into a beautiful ethereal vision which seduces the believer through its sheer beauty and its persuasiveness as a heavenly apparition. Of the six figures that appear on the left of the Louvre pictures, the two figures in the background wear sort of generic biblical uh, dress, and I'm sure they should be identified as Joachim and Anna, the Virgin's parents, who sometimes appear with her in images of the Immaculate Conception. Two of the others are portraits, and one of them may be confidently identified as Don Justino. He appears here both as a devotee of the Immaculada and the patron of the work, the donor. A later writer, Fean Bermudez, uh, who wrote very extensively on painting in Seville around 1800, confidently declared that Justino had in fact paid for all Murillo's paintings for Santa Maria la Blanca. We don't have documents that prove that, but Fean Bermudez uh, was a very uh, distinguished um, a researcher in his own right and may have had uh, access to uh, documents that showed that. This painting and its companion that we'll see in, in just a moment were also removed by the French in 1810. This one stayed in France, eventually ending up in the Louvre. A few years ago, <clears throat> when the church was being re restored, I mentioned it uh, earlier, um, I was wondering if we were able to uh, work out exactly where each of the pictures was positioned. And I was very surprised to discover that a fragment of the original frame had been left behind in the church. Um, this was a, uh, a virtual reconstruction that we made and we sort of extended that around the picture. But it was very pleasing to find that that bit of the original decoration around the Murillo painting was still there in situ. Uh, since the, uh, the, the, the church has been uh, uh, restored, um, some paintings have been commissioned from a copyist and have gone uh, into the original locations of the Murillos. Uh, at, at the end of the other aisle was the Triumph of Faith. Uh, this picture bears a text from the Gospel of St. John. Um, he loved them until, until the end. The female figure carries the chalice and host and rests her left arm on a large book and carries the keys, which refer to St. Peter and the spiritual authority of the church. She is an amalgam of faith and the church triumphant. In fact, the early sources call her both things. The prominence of the keys, right in the very middle of the picture, can, I think, be read as a private homage to Don Justino, whose second surname, you will recall, was Chavez, like Yavis, keys. The two paintings reflect two manifestations of God's love, his love for the Virgin Mary from the very beginning, and his love for the church until the end of time. That's what the two inscriptions refer to. Furthermore, uh, there is a Eucharistic link between the two scenes, and I think that that is readily made. The Virgin carries the incarnate God in her womb, and the Church administers the Eucharistic body of Christ. The juxtaposition of the Immaculate Conception and the Eucharist was the leitmotif of the spectacular celebrations that were held on the 5th of August, 1665, to mark the reopening of the Church of Santa Maria la Blanca. We know a great deal about these because a book to mark the event by the poet and writer Torre Farfan was published very, very soon after. 
In several of the sermons that were delivered on the occasion and were reported in Torre Farfan's book, the following phrase is repeated like a mantra. Blessed and praised be the holy sacrament of the altar and the immaculate conception of the most holy virgin conceived without the stain of original sin from the first moment of her existence. The festivities spilled out onto the street and the author describes a large temporary altar erected outside the church where mass was celebrated in the open air and which included several paintings lent by the confraternity of the Holy Sacrament that was based in the cathedral and by Don Justino himself, three of them by Murillo. This is a, 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 an evocation of uh, what that altar may have looked like uh, based on Torre Farfan's description. Some careful detective work enabled us to identify uh, the pictures by Murillo, which formed part of the altar, as these pictures here. Uh, we know that all three of these uh, belonged to uh, Justino de Neve, and they correspond with the uh, descriptions made by Torre Farfan. So this is a slight reworking based on Torre Farfan's uh, description. So you need to think of this as a large ephemeral uh, uh, structure with these um, tall Solomonic uh, columns with the uh, statue here on the altar of San Fernando um, and uh, the emblem of Seville, which is the uh, Giralda, uh, angels and uh, obelisks and so on. And then these uh, four pictures in set uh, within this uh, within this structure. Um, you can be confident on the 5th of August in Seville it's not going to rain, so there was no risk to uh, the works when they were uh, put out in the street. Um, at the top of the picture is a work by Herrera El Mozo. Uh, Herrera, the younger Francisco Herrera, um, was a very, very gifted contemporary of Murillo's. Um, he didn't spend a great deal of time in uh, Seville. He spent quite a bit of time in uh, in Madrid, and indeed had traveled to Italy uh, uh, as well. Um, he produced this picture in the mid-1650s for the confraternity of the sacrament in Seville uh, Cathedral. Um, and it's uh, a, a picture which once, once again combines those two uh, very great civilian devotions uh, to the Immaculate Conception, who appears here, and uh, to the Eucharist, which appears uh, in a monstrance over here and the uh, fathers of the church appear on the left-hand side. So that sat at the top, but underneath it sat this work here. Justino lent an immaculate conception, which turns out to be this work here, Murillo's most famous painting of the subject. Celebrated and copied in 17th and 18th century Spain, it was taken to France by that same Marshal Soult, whom we mentioned before, in the 1810s, and was bought by the Louvre in 1852. At that time, the most expensive picture ever acquired by a museum. In 1941, it was returned to Spain in a special exchange of works and was handed over to the Prado. A mixture of Assumption and Inmaculada is Murillo's most perfect rendition of the theme. Theology here seems to take a discreet backseat and Murillo has presented a sublime image of wondrous feminine beauty, more divine than human. Surrounded by a golden glow of heavenly light, the Virgin rises up into the Empyrean, accompanied by dozens of rosy angels tumbling around her, both playful and adoring. Curiously, there are relatively few symbols in the picture. No flowers, no palms, no stars. In fact, none of the emblems associated with the litany of the Virgin, which usually uh, accompany her, except the uh, moon uh, beneath her feet. The reason for this is given by Torre Farfan, and this was very interesting. He says that the emblems of the Virgin were carved into the very expensive frame which was painted and gilt. A few years ago, I was able to identify that frame, um, a frame that was also described in the inventory of Don Justino's collection made at his death in 1685. A painting of the pure and stainless conception of Our Lady, four varas in height. A painting by Murillo with its frame in which are carved her attributes. 
Um, well, the picture was eventually, after the death of Don Justino, uh, bought by the hospital of the Venerables Sacerdotes, and amazingly, the frame is still in the hospital. This is a montage, a virtual montage. Uh, we measured it up, of course, and the frame uh, fits perfectly um, to the, the painting. Um, those references to the emblems of the Virgin, um, the uh, emblems of the litany of Loreto, uh, the kinds of emblems that are often associated with her uh, iconography, uh, appear, uh, appear in, uh, on the frame itself, beautifully carved and decorated with the uh, Spanish estofado uh, technique where um, the uh, reliefs are painted, they're then covered with gold, and then the gold is scratched away. So here, for example, you see on the left the uh, emblem of the Cedar of Lebanon. On the right, uh, you see the Tower of David. Um, but of course, she's also described as the sealed fountain, uh, the palm tree, uh, the lily, and the iris, and so on. In the temporary altars we've just seen, set up outside the church of Santa Maria La Blanca, the Inmaculada was flanked by two smaller paintings uh, of the young St. John the Baptist and the Good Shepherd, both of which are in British collections. These two are identifiable in the inventory of Don Justino's collection, drawn up at his death in 1685. Torre Farfan describes how local collectors hung pictures from their balconies in the Plaza de Santa Maria La Blanca, and the local aristocrat, the Marquis de Villa Manrique, lent several of them. He mentions works by Ribera and the Cavaliere d'Arpino, as well as Luca Cambiaso, Artemisia Gentileschi, Titian, Rubens, Borgiani, and even Rembrandt, whom he calls Rebelan, the earliest reference to the artist in Spain, uh, made during Rembrandt's own lifetime. I, I did wonder whether I might be able to kind of gather together uh, these pictures uh, for that exhibition that, um, that uh, Xavier alluded to at the beginning. Um, but none, was, none of the references were specific enough to be able to uh, identify them. But here's uh, a Ribera that is in uh, Seville, a uh, Cavaliere d'Arpino of the Immaculada, and then uh, a Luca Cambiazzo, a Holy Family, that's what the subject was. Um, and this Artemisia Gentileschi, which does come from Seville Cathedral, so I suspect that may well have been one of the pictures that was hung in the square. So you have to imagine a very spectacular celebration. Uh, the church completely renewed, uh, that temporary altar placed in the piazza immediately in front of the facade, and then all around the square, uh, hangings, tapestries, and also these pictures. It was, must have been a very, very remarkable um, occasion. At the end of 1666, Don Justino de Neve was named Mayordomo de Fabrica, effectively canon superintendent of the fabric of Seville Cathedral. He was responsible for the upkeep and decoration of the building and had a considerable budget at his disposal. He engaged Murillo in two projects, the first of which was the completion of the altar wall of the baptistry chapel that we saw a moment ago, where Murillo, a decade earlier, had painted the great uh, St. Anthony and the Christ Child. To crown the altarpiece, he uh, asked Murillo to paint a large scene of the baptism of Christ, a subject that, of course, suited the liturgical function of this chapel, the baptistry chapel. And he also commissioned from the same carver, I believe, uh, who had made the uh, the, the, the picture frame that you saw just a moment ago, Bernardo Simón de Pineda, um, the uh, exterior uh, setting of the altar. Uh, for the, uh, the, 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 the wonderful painting of the, uh, baptis uh, the Baptism of Christ, which was recently restored uh, at the Prado, it is a very, very marvelous um, painting, um, there is a, a, an oil sketch, which we've not managed to trace, but um, Murillo is one of the first painters in Spain who starts using the uh, oil sketch as a way in which to work out his composition and no doubt also to show it to uh, his uh, patron. So there's a considerable number of small-scale oil sketches uh, related to larger compositions by uh, Murillo, and I think that's a very interesting subject for somebody to pursue at some point. 
Even more significantly, perhaps, Don Justino asked Murillo to produce some paintings for the chapter house, the place where the cathedral canons gathered to discuss cathedral business and one of the most beautiful buildings in the city. Um, this curious uh, photograph shows its, its beauf beautiful um, ovoid form. Um, it's one of the most elegant uh, examples of, I suppose, Spanish Christian humanist uh, architecture of uh, the 16th century. So the canons uh, would and still do uh, sit around here and discuss the uh, subjects relating to uh, the, the running of the cathedral and decisions that have to be taken about its finances and so on. And then up above their heads was a series of uh, uh, allegories and a series of uh, reliefs uh, based mostly on, on New Testament subjects. They're quite complex subjects in, in, in some cases. And then here, directly above uh, the scene of the uh, Assumption of the Virgin, sorry, is that visible? There we are. Uh, immediately above the scene of the Assumption of the Virgin, uh, Murillo was commissioned by Justino de Neve on behalf of the chapter uh, to paint a new uh, Immaculate Conception. That's a view into the uh, dome. Uh, but not only the Immaculate Conception, but also to replace some tondi uh, around the ceiling, which had been uh, damaged by water coming through the roof, uh, which are images of... Uh, civilian saints. This uh, Immaculate Conception uh, is painted on panel. Um, it's one of the most famous uh, versions of the subject by, uh, by Murillo in Seville and is presented in a grandiose polychromed frame inscribed with those words that we've heard uh, before, Inmaculada en el primer instante de su ser, uh, Immaculate from the first instant of her being. So these are the works that Don Justino was able to directly commission from, uh, from Murillo uh, during the two years when he was uh, responsible for the structure and the decoration of uh, the cathedral. This was a job which was passed around uh, the different uh, canons. I'd like to devote just a few moments to the collection formed by Don Justino de Neve. It is a quite an important one. The main source for understanding his interest in painting is the inventory of the collection drawn up on the 28th of June, 1685, immediately after Don Justino's death. The document lists some 160 pictures, which for a non-aristocratic collection is a very considerable number. And it's more than double uh, uh, the number of pictures in any of the other canons collections that we know of. Most significantly, it contained an important group of paintings uh, given to Murillo, 18, as well as a portrait of the artist, not described by his hand, but possibly a self-portrait, demonstrating Justino's loyalty and personal commitment to uh, the painter. Only the wealthy Flemish merchant collector resident in Seville, Nicolas Omazur, whose portrait is downstairs in the exhibition here, ended up having more Murillos than Neve, 31 in total. But many of these were not actually commissioned from the artist, but rather bought after the painter's death. In Don Justino's inventory, in addition to Murillo, only one artist is named, Luis de Morales, by whom Justino owned an Ecce Homo. There are a small number of works identified as from Rome or paintings from Flanders, but otherwise the entries in the document focus principally on subject matter. Of those 160 works, about two-thirds are religious subjects, virgins, saints, mm, apostolados, several New Testament scenes, but only one Old Testament subject, Belshazzar's Feast. Uh, Thirteen paintings are historical, mythological, or allegorical, with very low valuation, and a large painting of nymphs dancing naked, rather strange, and eight landscapes, and eleven portraits and 10 still lifes. Among the portraits was his own, um, Murillo's portrait of Don Justino himself, some family members, several priests, and a, a deceased man wearing a Franciscan habit. Six pictures that we would classify as genre paintings, including a girl with a bunch of grapes, a water cellar, and a boy with a crossbow. All these pictures are lost or anyway unidentified. 
As regards the Murillos in Justino's collection, the very first work listed is the Immaculate Conception, which we saw a moment ago, which had the highest valuation at 7,200 reales, nearly five times more than the next most highly valued pictures, also by Murillo. It may have hung in Justino's private oratory, perhaps flanked by the Good Shepherd and the St. John the Baptist with a lamb that we saw a moment ago. In his will, he bequeathed two works to the Venerables Sacerdotes, his own portrait and a penitent St. Peter. That work was known to have made its way to Britain in the 19th century, but was subsequently lost sight of. This photograph surfacing in the 1970s. About seven years ago, I was fortunate enough to trace it to a house on the Isle of Man and managed to persuade the owner to lend it to the exhibition at the Prado. It was sold in 2014 and was acquired by the Focus Foundation, which is based in the hospital of the Venerables. And here you see it after its recent cleaning at the Prado. So effectively, the picture has returned home. A painting commissioned by Don Justino from Murillo, stays in his collection, is bequeathed by him to the hospital of the Venerables, leaves Spain, goes to France, ends up in England, and is reacquired for uh, the Hospital de los Venerables just a few years ago. Don Justino's collection of Murillo's is interesting because it included a great variety of works, including a portrait, we've seen it, uh, <clears throat> allegories, large religious pictures, flower paintings, and small devotional pictures. The infantry lists two paintings of spring and summer, which correspond to the beautiful paintings in Dulwich, this one here, the flower girl, and in Edinburgh, a uh, young man with a basket of fruit, an allegory of summer. Although Neve was interested in genre paintings, unlike Omazur, he did not own any of Murillo's beggar children paintings. Three small devotional paintings by Murillo are described in the inventory as on stone, laminas de piedra. Two are today in the Louvre, and the third, a nativity, is in Houston, uh, which was recently identified as having this Justino provenance. In fact, although Neve had other small works on stone, copper, wood, and in wax, these three are painted on a much rarer and intriguing support. Not slate, as you might imagine uh, from the description too, laminas de piedra, but actually on obsidian, Mexican obsidian. Reminiscent in appearance uh, of small paintings on slate of the kind executed by uh, the Bassanos or Alessandro Turchi, the color and reflective character of the support is made to play a part in the aesthetic effect of uh, the whole. This beautiful small picture, I've given you the dimensions there, um, of course uh, allows a lot of the uh, obsidian surface uh, to show. So effectively it's only the colored bits uh, that are painted on. All the rest is the surface of the obsidian uh, showing. This, uh, these, these interesting photographs show uh, the reverse and you can see the glassy uh, quality of uh, the obsidian. Uh, and then you can see the, the, the rough uh, edges on the, on the left, on the, on the right-hand slide there. Um, another uh, shows the subject of Christ tied to the column with uh, St. Peter, also in the uh, Louvre. And the third is the nativity that I mentioned before uh, now in Houston. And here I think you can see how the artist has uh, suggested even the kind of presence of uh, weather by incorporating the natural kind of striations of, uh, of the uh, obsidian. It's pretty rare to find paintings on uh, obsidian, and it has been suggested that Justino's intention may have been to Christianize objects that may uh, have been known then to have had a ritualistic significance for uh, uh, the Aztecs in Aztec religious practice. Um, but it is perfectly plausible that these obsidian supports were used primarily because of the exotic nature of the material and its particular vitreous surface quality. In his will, uh, Justino bequeathed the nativity, this one here, which he himself uh, describes as on stone. So you wonder actually how much he, he really um, knew about the origins of the support. 
uh, to the Charter House of Seville with the instruction that the prior put it wherever he wanted in memory of the great affection in which the canon held the monastery. Um, many of you will know that in Aztec uh, religious practice, uh, these uh, smoking mirrors, as they're called, these um, very finely uh, wrought pieces of uh, obsidian uh, were felt to give access uh, to the world of uh, the dead. So you would be able, in a way, to look through them to the realm beyond. Uh, some of the murillos, unfortunately, remain uh, unidentified. There were four paintings of angels with attributes, um, two paintings, presumably pendants, the Virgin and St. John, and two flower paintings, uh, one with lilies and the other with roses. No floreros by Murillo are known today, but two flower paintings by him are recorded in his son, Gaspar's post-mortem inventory of 1709. And Fern Bermudez, whom I, whom I mentioned earlier, refers several times to Murillo painting flower pieces, at one point declaring that few Spaniards equaled him in landscape and flower paintings. Flowers, of course, appear in several of his religious compositions, and we saw some in the Dulish flower girl uh, who proffers a handful of pink and white roses to the viewer. Neve also owned four small oval paintings of saints on copper, which later passed to Omazur. In Neve's infantry, they are not given an attribution, but in Omazur's, and they're certainly the same pictures, they are described as by Murillo. This confirms that Murillo also produced miniature paintings, which we didn't really know about until a short while ago. But even more significantly, it adds another four works by the artists to Neve's already impressive tally of 18, bringing it up to 22. Until very recently, I said, no miniatures by Murillo were known, but one has recently surfaced, and its subject, the dream of St. Joseph, corresponds with the identification of one of the saints in that quartet of small oval paintings in the Neve and Omazur collections. On the reverse is uh, St. Francis of Paola. Paired in his collection with the portrait showing Murillo, uh, Don Costino also had one of the civilian sculptor, Juan Martinez Montañez, an artist with whom I think it's unlikely that Don Costino would have had personal contact. The stone under which the earthly remains of Don Costino lie in the Cathedral of Seville records only two of his achievements, his 40 years of service in the chapter and his role as promoter of the hospital of the Venerables Sacerdotes, which you see here on screen. The foundation and decoration of this charitable institution engaged him very intensively in his last decade. The Venerable Sacerdotes was established to care for priests who were elderly and infirm or poor and in need of housing and care. There's the beautiful uh, patio in the center of the building. Uh, the uh, hospital also contains a very spectacular church, which I pointed out to you in that uh, aerial view of the city right at the beginning. And of course, large rooms that served as infirmaries and of course, the refectory. The hospital was built with funds that came partly from the land and properties that it owned and partly from the Archdiocese of Seville and private donations. Don Justino played a leading role in its construction, uh, which began in the mid-1670s and was not completed for 20 years. He didn't see it completed himself. He was also responsible for uh, elaborating the statues of the Brotherhood, which were published in 1676. These are uh, paintings from the early 18th century uh, that show the um, uh, priests being looked after by members of the confraternity that ran uh, the hospital. So there they are being uh, welcomed. This is a, a traveler priest. You can see he's got a, a pilgrim staff. And here's a scene showing uh, noblemen who are members of the confraternity who uh, served the sick priests. That's how uh, the confraternities uh, operated. And uh, many of these confraternities operate in exactly the same way uh, today in Seville. As we have seen, Don Costino bequeathed two Murillo paintings from his own collection to the Venerables Sacerdotes, his own portrait, and the Penitent St. Peter. But in 1679, some years before he died, uh, Justino was instrumental in getting Murillo the commission to paint the Virgin and Child distributing bread to priests, now in Budapest. This work was painted very appropriately for the refectory. 
I said that the house served the needs of sick and elderly priests and clergymen who were traveling. And the three priests at lower right, who are beneficiaries of this divine sandwich lunch, uh, reflect these groups. The balding, white, bearded priest, the sallow-faced, sickly cleric behind, uh, and the priest with the pilgrim staff. The subject matter illustrates the charitable purposes of the hospital and also leads to the theme of Christ distributing the bread of the Eucharist, food for the body and for the soul. For more than a century, the work hung in the refectory where the retired priests would eat their meals, constantly reminded that the charity they benefited from there came ultimately from Christ himself. The relationship between Don Justino uh, and, uh, uh, and Murillo was at its most intense in the mid to late 1660s. In the 1670s, Don Justino seems to have focused his attention on his cathedral duties, on the construction of the Hospital de los Venerables, and on taking care of his large family. He was close to Archbishop Spinola, who was our Archbishop until he died in 1684, and I think we can identify Don Justino in one of the set of paintings made by Valdes Leal for the decoration of the chapel in the Archbishop's palace, adjacent to the cathedral that we also saw in that aerial shot. The paintings show episodes from the life of the fourth century St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, and namesake, of course, of Ambrosio Spinola, the, the um, Archbishop of Seville. Valdes Leal painted St. Ambrose with the likeness of Spinola, and in the scene in which he absolves the Emperor Theodosius, who had repented after committing a massacre, he represents the bishop accompanied by several contemporary figures. Don Justino is, I think, recognizable as the priest in modern dress standing immediately behind the bishop. And we can now compare the three uh, portraits we have of Don Justino. Here he is, uh, I think, nearly a decade older. He would have to be about a, a decade older than he was when uh, Murillo painted him in 1665. Murillo died in 1682, Don Justino just three years later. The epitaph on Don Justino's tombstone that I alluded to earlier in Seville Cathedral is brief but eloquent. Here lies Don Justino de Neve y Chavez, canon of this patriarchal church for 40 years, a man born for the temple. Vir Templonatus, founder of the Hospital of the Venerables Sacerdotes. He died on the 14th of June, 1685, at the age of 60. May he rest in peace. But this story has an epilogue. In 1686, I said, the Hospital de los Venerables acquired Don Justino's Immaculate Conception from his heirs. They installed it, in the frame it came with, in the church. There it remained until 1810, when it was removed from its frame and taken to Paris in 1813, once again, by Marshal Soult. The frame, as we said, remained in situ and was filled with another rather mediocre Immaculada by an anonymous artist. In 2012, we had the exceptional opportunity to reunite frame and picture in the church of the Venerables itself. The painting returned to its altar for three months in the Church of the Venerables, just over two centuries after it had left. These things simply do not happen very often. It was a remarkable event, and all of Seville turned out to see it. And it happened in the context of a very special research project, a very special exhibition uh, devoted to the relationship between Murillo and Justino de Neve entitled Murino and Justino Neve, The Art of Friendship. Thank you very much indeed.